If the calories in, calories out equation meant anything, then one 12 ounce soda per day would give more than 50,000 additional calories every year and lead to 15 or 16 pounds of weight gain. Strangely, this is not really the case. You might gain an extra pound a year this way, but certainly not 15. Vegans and gym bros will come up with some hand-waving that burning carbs raises thyroid levels, which is supposed to be healthy in spite of thyroid hormone destroying your lean tissue. In reality, the main problem is that fructose and sugar is destroying your mitochondria, which slowly lowers your metabolism over time. It also triggers fat storage mechanisms in the body. Amazingly, it's been found that saccharin, which is non-caloric, produces about twice the weight gain of sugar over time. That's because it does even more damage to the body on a cellular level. Irradiated food also has the same effect because it is heavily oxidized and also leads to a fatty liver. All the produce and meat at Costco is oxidized, so it should be avoided if possible. Sulfates that are common additives in shampoo also have the same effect. Yes, even your shampoo is making you fat. It's also a common air pollutant. Even the air itself is making people fatter. Even worse, carbohydrates inherently produce far more oxidative damage than fat or protein, especially when it comes to fructose. So don't take this as an excuse to indulge in some junk food, because what you eat really does matter. Oh God, these are good. Uh, Sydney, can you leave some for us? <laughs> I thought you were um, trying to lose weight. Lay off me, I'm starving. <laughs> A few people were a bit upset about the vitamin C video. There are some studies where they cook vegetables and test for vitamin C afterwards, but they don't test for DHAA, which is what you'll find in animal product. They also assume that the values the FDA uses are actually in the vegetables to begin with, but those come from a time where all the food was organic, from undepleted soil, and it was picked when ripe. Today you can't rely on any of these values and they probably are much lower on all fronts. More importantly, when you burn vitamin C, what do you get? You get DHAA. But since no one is testing for DHAA, the whole experiment is useless. Until relatively recently, it was assumed that only ascorbic acid can be used by the body. But experiments have shown this is not true. Aside from pigs, no animal can make use of DHAA, but humans can. So anything based on this assumption is simply invalid, and that's basically everything that people have been taught in school or have looked at in studies. So don't listen to nonsense about cooking destroying vitamin C. All it will do is turn into DHAA, which is much more absorbable and much more useful. DHAA is more heat stable than ascorbic acid and while it will eventually degrade further and become useless it won't happen nearly that easily. You also don't need to worry about absorbing pure L-cysteine instead of NAC or AAKG instead of calcium alpha ketoglutarate. When you have a weak bond like a calcium or magnesium salt or that in acetic acid, in liquid the bond essentially just dissolves. Not to mention you also have strong acid in your stomach. So if you're taking one form of something, it's almost always going to absorb as well as another form. There's just some exceptions sometimes with getting through the blood-brain barrier and things like that. Most of the rest of it is just that people are suggesting you buy things that are more expensive and make them more money. But more importantly, do you even want vitamin C in the diet? You do need a minuscule amount of DHAA or ascorbic acid in the diet for collagen, but the human body already has very strong antioxidants. Glutathione, glycine, taurine, coenzyme Q10, and even phosphatidylserine and uric acid 
are very powerful antioxidants. These also all come from animal products and they're much more safe than ascorbic acid. That is, they're less reactive and they won't cause damage to the body. All the anti-cancer mechanisms and so on all applies to these substances as well, even more so. And while people have pointed to things that vitamin C does that it's supposedly needed for the immune system, well, we didn't have it in the diet. We only had it in small quantities. So it really makes no sense to take these large, large amounts of something that's never been a part of the human diet. While oxidation is bad, chemically reducing substances can also be bad. It's having substances randomly reacting in the body that's going to cause problems. And that's why it really makes no sense to take a vitamin C supplement. I've talked in the past about how carbs produce more reactive oxygen species which leads to a reduction in mitochondria in damage to insulin receptors, which leads to insulin resistance. I've also talked about chemicals like sulfates and pesticides doing the same thing. Recently, chloramquat in the grain supplies caused the recall of many major cereal brands. A new study in the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology found 80% of Americans have tested positive for a harmful pesticide called chloramquat. The impacts can be substantial, including delayed puberty, slow fetal growth, and even fertility issues. Aside from processing, you just can't trust even the raw ingredients of plant-based foods anymore. I'd also say to look at the price per pound of these foods, and it's just ridiculous. It actually costs more for these cereals than it costs for meat a lot of the time. You know, you can pay $7 a pound for a box of cereal or even more, and you can get steak for that much. You can get a couple pounds of ground beef, and you can get like seven pounds of ham a lot of the time. While quormquat is an illegal substance in the civilized world anyway, the corrupt FDA allows companies to purchase grain from anywhere on the planet, including the ones where illegal pesticides are common. Quormquat damages the DNA, it destroys mitochondria, and it even leads to sterility and birth defects too on top of that. Guess what? There's a new study out from Professor Lustig that shows strong evidence that it is similar in mechanism to the foods that we eat, which cause us obesity. That is the oxidation in the body, the reactive oxygen species and the damage to mitochondria are causing us to be fat. I've been leaning in this direction for a while because it becomes more and more clear that the real problem is not calories so much as certain foods and the way that they cause us problems in the body. Not to mention the many, many chemicals that are obesogenic and share similar pathways of damage. And this is also what leads to aging and cancer. It's ultimately reactive oxygen species and glycation that age us, destroy our DNA, destroy elastin and collagen that cause wrinkles. And it's especially hard on your mitochondria which are the basis of your basal metabolic rate. The effect is so profound that the average body temperature has lowered dramatically in recent decades. How do you explain the fact that body temperature is going down in the American population over the last 150 years? So this is from Civil War records. And this is from most recent, you know, gathering of data from EPIC, or Electronic Medical Record. Okay? And you can see, for whites, for blacks, no, doesn't matter the age, okay? there has been a decline, a steady decline in body temperature in everyone. Everyone says, you know, we're supposed to be 98.6. Well, guess what? We're not 98.6 anymore. We're more like 97.3. How come we're all burning less energy to give off less heat? Is it because we're starving and don't have the energy to produce? Clearly not. If anything, we have more energy. But something's not working to generate that heat. 
because the heat is a byproduct of energy metabolism. So we're not burning energy in order to maintain our body temperature. Second problem related. Every one of these crosses is a different species in captivity. And what you can see is that over the last 25 years, every species in captivity has increased their body weight. Living in the same captive environment and eating the same captive food as they always did. They're not humans. They're not gluttons and sloths. They only eat what you give them. And they're all gaining weight anyway. How do you explain that? Something else is going on. Is it the same thing that's causing our defective energy metabolism? Maybe so. Second problem. No child chooses to be obese because the, the quality of life of an obese child is the same as the quality of life of a, a child on cancer chemotherapy. No one chooses to be obese. No one. Okay. It happens to people, but no one chooses it. Okay. Number three, this isn't just about America. You know, you, you can say, hey, we're gluttons and sloths or the UK, they're gluttons and sloths, or Australia, they're gluttons and sloths. It's happening everywhere. The whole world is having this problem. There is not one country on the planet that has a stable rate of obesity. It's climbing everywhere, okay? In places that don't even have our diet, okay? 175 out of 185 countries even in countries that don't exercise this notion of personal responsibility. And number four, which I think is the kicker, we have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds and we have an epidemic of obese newborns. Newborns don't diet and exercise. How come the um, mean birth weight of Babies born in the U.S., South Africa, Israel, and Russia are all up by 200 grams. And when you actually do the DEXA scanning on those babies, those 200 grams are not muscle, they are fat. It also destroys our stem cells over time. Between mitochondrial dysfunction and stem cell loss, that's basically aging in a nutshell. The reason you go gray over time is that you run out of stem cells. And if you run out of enough of them, you also lose the hair itself and go bald. Cortisol can cause this, which can come from stress, but mainly comes from a high carb, high insulin diet because cortisol tends to creep up in response to insulin as it becomes chronically elevated. Cortisol causes excessive stem cell release, but does not regenerate them. You are supposed to mainly release them when you're fasting and when you do, the stem cells are protected and ready to regenerate new ones for the stem cell pool. Simply eating carbs also destroys your stem cells and gives you gray hair because you release far more reactive oxygen species this way. When fructose is metabolized in cells, it creates a byproduct called methylglyoxal. This has poisoned your mitochondria and is strongly associated with dementia and cancer. Even when cells burn glucose, they do more damage because the first mitochondrial complex is also the one that cleans up after itself the least well. And this is where the initial glycolysis happens. Thankfully, in normal circumstances, most of our energy production in the body comes from burning free fatty acids, in spite of what many claim online and what basic textbooks will say for biochemistry only during intense exercise does the body burn more carbs than fat veg oils containing linoleic acid are also very harmful to mitochondria linoleic acid combines with glucose in the mitochondria to form malondialdehyde which is a genotoxin that causes a great deal of damage other PUFAs like EPA and DHA do not have this issue. They actually have an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect within the mitochondria. While their real purpose in the body is a building block for the brain, 
You should also be aware that they are not harmful to consume as long as they are not oxidized. Unfortunately, fish oil is always highly oxidized, though the more expensive brands will tend to have much less oxidation. Yet it's still better to have oxidized EPA and DHA than to be deficient. The oxidized fats will become liver fat, but eventually the EPA and DHA will be released into the bloodstream. If you can, it's much better to get this from actual fish, such as sardines or herring. This is still going to be a bit oxidized, but much less so than fish oil. And you should keep in mind all the food you eat is partially oxidized, even when you eat it raw. And processed foods are extremely oxidized, such as veg oil and also wheat crackers and anything basically that has wheat or sugar in it. These small oily fish also have little or no mercury or other contaminants, unlike larger fish, and they're full of other wonderful nutrients. Another way a high carb diet damages you is through insulin resistance. A high carb diet increases triglycerides in the body, which is one of the most reliable markers of bad health. This creates an osmotic pressure gradient in the bloodstream that pushes fat into the cells. This isn't a problem for saturated fats, which are too large to pass into the cell uninvited. Unfortunately, it's a big problem for linoleic acid, which is small enough to easily get pushed through the cell membrane, even if the cell does not want it in there. Not only does this cause damage from malondialdehyde, but large amounts of linoleic acid can actually choke the cell's ability to burn fuel at all. In order to cleave a triglyceride, the cell requires glucose, but if the cell is insulin resistant from excess carbs and gets flooded with linoleic acid, then it runs out of glucose and it can't take more in. This leads to a buildup of diglycerides in the cell and the cell completely loses the ability to create energy either through fat or through sugar. This means the cell is going down the road towards being senescent or even becoming cancerous. So what's the solution? First off, carb consumption is bad at the cellular level. Any amount is bad because it's going to produce more reactive oxygen species than burning fat will. At the same time, your body is quite amazing at dealing with almost anything you eat, and it can be challenging for people to adjust to a zero carb diet. So eating 50 or 100 carbs a day is probably not going to make a huge difference to most people, and it's going to be a lot harder to stick to that zero carb diet. But since many people want to have the optimal amount of everything, every little detail, this is the optimal level, it's zero. That's the first thing you should worry about when it comes to your diet is how much carbs are in your diet because that's the most harmful thing to most people. People also always want to take a pill or eat some special food, but the hard fact is that this is going to have more effect than anything else you can do as far as dietary interventions go. And you may think you need carbs, but you don't. Dietary fat is composed of a glycerol backbone, attached to three fatty acids. That's what a triglyceride is. This glycerol is easily converted by the body into glucose, and it's the main substrate of gluconeogenesis. It also does not spike insulin or cortisol, and it doesn't cause any oxidation at all in this conversion, and it doesn't produce ammonia when it's broken down. This provides more than enough blood glucose in your body to meet all of its needs in most circumstances. When in ketosis, the brain prefers ketones to glucose at a factor of around 2.5 to 1. So no, you don't need glucose for the brain either, in spite of this being constantly repeated. Only red blood cells are proven to require glucose, and that is because they need to save the oxygen they carry for the brain and other organs. Conversely, animal products have the opposite effect, especially beef which is rich in stearic acid. 
Stearic acid is basically a palmitic acid molecule with an extra bit of vinegar slapped on. In the cell, fatty acids and carbs are ultimately chopped up into vinegar and burn inside the mitochondria to create energy. But vinegar itself has many special properties that can reverse the insulin resistance that we all have in our bodies and do much more. This is probably part of why stearic acid burning is shown to create new mitochondria in the body. So when you eat carbs, you are destroying your metabolism by killing your mitochondria. But when you eat healthy animal fats like beef, it does the opposite. The other way animal products help with this issue is that they are full of healthy antioxidants and that stops this damage to the mitochondria. In fact, there's much more antioxidants in animal products than there are in plants, which only have vitamin C and vitamin E, which are actually very questionable ones to supplement. Glutathione is created from methionine, which is lacking in plant foods. Uric acid is also an antioxidant, and while it is vitrified, it is perfectly fine in the body so long as glutathione levels are high enough, and they will be if you eat plenty of meat and other animal products and you don't excessively eat carbs. In fact, those on a keto diet are shown to have twice the level of glutathione as those on the standard American diet. Uric acid and fructose are produced in large amounts by the liver when you are on a high carb diet and have metabolic syndrome. And this is the true cause of gout, metabolic syndrome from a high carb diet. Many internet doctors love to suggest supplementing coenzyme Q10 as a antioxidant to protect your mitochondria. And this isn't a terrible idea, but for some reason, none of them will tell you that you can just eat meat and other animal products and get plenty of it and that it's very low in plant foods. You could probably supplement this, but if you eat a proper diet, you'll probably be getting plenty and a lot of these supplements can be very expensive, especially the one called MitoQ. And that's basically the same problem with Urolithin A. It's very expensive and it probably does work somewhat, but you can just get the same effect by just eating more animal products because you're going to get way more antioxidants. It's not commonly mentioned, but vitamin A is also an antioxidant and it's one that you can only get in proper levels from animals. Aside from the stated levels of vitamins and plants often being vastly exaggerated because they don't account for modern agricultural practices. In plants, it only comes as beta carotene, which many people cannot make proper use of. Vitamin E is another antioxidant, but one with many variants and many possible pitfalls. Suffice it to say that if you're eating some grass-fed beef or dairy, you're going to get plenty of vitamin E and you're going to get the right types and in the right ratios. Glycine is also an antioxidant, and in large doses it can turn the mitochondria of a 98-year-old man into the mitochondria of a young boy. This was proven very literally in experiments. Even on a carnivore diet, glycine can easily be lacking as you mainly get it from broth, which is not commonly eaten in large amounts today. But just 100 years ago, our ancestors were getting about 15 grams more a day than we do. And some researchers suggest we should even be getting 20 grams or 40 grams a day. It is often, often contaminated in the food supply due to the ubiquity of glyphosate. So it's definitely something most people should supplement because the supplement is going to be wholly synthetic and you don't have to worry about glyphosate. Taurine also has antioxidant properties and is vital for controlling the membranes of your cells and your mitochondria. Taurine greatly helps with mitochondrial function and is even shown to help with heart failure in Japanese studies because of this. As with glycine, the modern diet is sadly lacking in taurine, even for those who eat large amounts of meat. So unless you're going to eat foods like oxtail soup and beef heart every day, then this is also something you should probably supplement 
And you probably also want it to be wholly synthetic as that's going to be the safest form. The oils common in fatty fish, EPA and DHA also have antioxidant properties. So long as they are not already processed and oxidized themselves, these fatty acids can help your mitochondria a great deal. This is important not only for the brain, but also the heart. I'd avoid the salmon because it is seldom truly wild caught today and it's often mislabeled. But herring, sardines, and other small fatty fish are not farmed, and they have little or no mercury, and they will not have significant levels of oxidation in the can or fresh. The phospholipid phosphatidylserine is also an antioxidant, which is especially important for the brain. In addition, it keeps the cell membrane intact, which is very important for mitochondrial health. Again, this is common in all animal products, though it is highest in the brain. An inferior form can be found in soy lecithin, but I don't recommend it. Aside from that, the only plant-based source is white beans, which has a fair amount. And white beans are by far the healthiest form of beans that you could consume. If you're going to get beans, only ever get white beans. But there's some question as to whether this plant-based form actually works the same way the animal-based form does. And that's why a lot of these supplements are not allowed to use the claims that were once allowed for phosphatidylserine anymore. You've probably heard of the Wim Hof method by now. This can also increase mitochondria, but only if you actually shiver while doing it. If you don't shiver, you're just wasting your time. If you've watched my old videos, you will also know you can do the same thing by just hopping up and down or even standing on a vibration platform. It's the actual shaking of the fat cells that causes succinate to be released and this increases mitochondrial biogenesis. For that matter, you can just take succinate as a supplement. I've seen magnesium succinate on the web a few times. And they also sell pure succinate as a supplement in some countries, though I've never seen it for sale in Western countries. And last but not least, fasting. Fasting is going to help with almost everything health related, and it's no different in this case. Fasting has been shown to help a great deal with generating new mitochondria and also reversing insulin resistance and the damage of oxidation and glycation. When you fast, you quickly burn the smaller fatty acids off. And this also allows you to burn stearic acid, which in turn helps create even more new mitochondria. And fasting is going to probably be the thing that's going to help the most with anti-aging. Though we don't really know how much it's going to help in humans. It's definitely going to make you look and feel much better and avoid a lot of nasty diseases, especially cancer. While antioxidants are important, the best antioxidants are all in animal product. And beyond that, the best thing you can do for the body is to limit carbs so you won't have as many reactive oxygen species in the first place. When you try to address the issue with foods from the plant kingdom, you're always going to be trading one problem for another. Two years in the brig. So instead of the original charge on a possible sentence of two years in the brig, <laughs> they've been found guilty on another charge and got an entirely different two years in the brig. That's going to be a great comfort to them.